You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. So the the big theme of today is one final thing I really want to look at with the uh, Green Bay Packers and the Detroit Lions, and that's snap counts. And, and as boring as that might sound, it's actually really interesting for a couple reasons. Number one, when you find out how many total snaps a guy got, you kind of get an idea of who's being utilized most. In other words, we can find out who... Wide receiver 1, 2, 3, and 4 are. We know who tight end 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are. Did you even know that there was a tight end 5? Do you know who wide receiver 4 is right now? Um, The offensive line, where they all lined up, we kind of looked at that already. But then also the running backs. But not just who's 1, 2, 3, and 4, but also where did they line up? For the tight ends, in line, slot, out wide, wide receiver, who's in the slot? Who's the official number two? Who's in the backfield? You get the point. Same thing for defense. Zadarius, outside linebacker, defensive end, nose tackle. And again, who's the number one, two, three, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, you, you track that through the year. And we, we've talked about things like they're going to be using Rashawn more. Did they use him more in this game? So I actually think it's, it's extremely important. And I'm ashamed of myself for not discussing this already. But this is our last attempt to really round this out and close the chapter on week one before we dive into uh, to this week. And I'm pretty excited because I've, I've set myself up to um, in such a way that I, I, I like this layout a little better because tomorrow is going to be more of just a, a, I guess we'll call it a deep dive, as cheesy as that sounds, but really just throwing everything at the wall as far as Packers-Lions. I have a lot of work to do today in terms of uh, research and all this stuff. And then Sunday, the plan will be, it's going to be what I like to call Positivity Sunday, which is basically just a big old pregame party. So we're not doing picks on Sunday, we're just, we're having a, we're having a good old time. Now, I've got several thank yous to get through. Um, Really, really appreciative of all the support that I've gotten. And fortunately, thanks to your support, um, we've got about four or five people, four-ish people to thank. So we're really only still about 4,000 away um, for me being able to call it quits. <laughs> so we're so close, and there's just a couple days until I have to go back to work. So we'll call it four down, 3,996 more subscriptions to go. And man, I can really realize my dream. And uh... <laughs> That's all right, next year. We'll get them next year. But I do want to say thank you very much for the support from uh, Robert Erfer. Come on, man. It's a, it's the same thing as, like, uh, Edan, which he corrected me on how to say his name, which I probably still got wrong. It's a real simple U-R-F-E-R, but it's like, that's not a that's not a thing, right? Erfer? I mean, I'm not making fun of it. My name is Schlipp. That's a stupid name. I'm just saying. I feel like I shouldn't mess that up, and I know I got it wrong somehow. But thank you very much. Um, he basically signed up for a one-month excuse me, a dollar a month subscription for two years and just went on Venmo. So he's getting creative with it, and I do appreciate that. He just went around the fees, and that's always a bonus. Also, a big shout-out to Joshua Cordova for jumping in on Venmo. Really, really appreciate the support, my man. And then apparently the uh, the one-year subscription has become really, really popular. I'm glad I did it. I actually didn't like the idea at first, but I think I'm good with it. I was like, man, I really like the the monthly numbers and... Plus, you get a discount, which means I get less, and it makes me sad. But I don't, I don't mind getting, I don't mind it. it. It makes sense, and it's, you know, it re-ups next year. Hopefully, you guys stick around. But thank you very much to Micah Olson and Christopher Malagese. Malagese. I know it's Italian, and I'm just trying to figure out the right amount of Sopranos inflection to put into this, right? Do I go full on the Godfather and, and risk offending people, or should I just 2020 Midwest white boy this thing up? And sound like a dummy. Could just say Malagese. We'll just go with Malagese and just we'll just say I'm an idiot. But thank you guys all very much. Uh, since basically day one, the support for the show is uh, confusing, but very much appreciated. Appreciated. Appreciative. 
and appreciated. I genuinely think this is one of the more rare podcasts out there in that it's still extremely unknown. Like if you go out into the Twitter sphere and you just polled people, like list all the Packers podcasts, mine would rank really low. But I think in terms of like support from the people that do listen, I, I think it's just through the roof for this podcast. People are so ridiculously invested and it just gets me super jacked up. And I, I would much rather have that, to be completely honest. I know it sounds like I'm lying, but I promise you I'm not. I love, I'm very proud of that aspect of this show. And that really comes through in the in the Facebook group. So if you're not in there and you want to know what I'm talking about, get in there and you'll understand a little bit better what I'm talking about. Speaking of, we have 992 members in the Packernet Podcast Facebook group. So we're eight away from 1,000. So if you want to know what your goal is today outside of uh, jumping in that buck a month, man, you can do a yearly, you can hit me up on Venmo, whatever kind of creative way we can get you involved in that. Again, 4,000 more. I, I believe, I, I genuinely believe I'm not going to work on Monday. I believe it in my soul. I almost didn't cry myself to sleep last night thinking about going back to work. First time in a long time. Just, I, I know what's happening, man. And I am not having a breakdown. Just totally normal conversation between two friends, you and I. But outside of that goal, what I need you to do is go out and find some of your Packer friends. Tell them about this podcast and get them in this group, man. I want to go over a 1,000 today. We need more than a 1,000 people in this group for the Packers versus the Lions game. That's what we got to do. Big things. All right, why don't we take a break right here and just start running through uh, this final little tidbit about the Packers-Lions. It's not too late, and you know you want to. You know you're itching. I'm telling you, man, we're going to spice up this Packers-Lions game this Sunday with a little bit of side action from my bookie. It's nothing better than watching live sports and betting live. So not only can you bet on the Packers, but you can bet on things like, will Andy Reid wear a face shield? The first NFL coach to be fined for no mask. Sean McVay is is leading the charge on that one. The first NFL team to host 30,000 fans for a 2020 game. That's actually a pretty good question. I'm getting excited just thinking about it. First NFL team to have a breakout. We're not even discussing that ugliness. Shame on you. The 2020 to 2021 AP NFL Offensive Player of the Year. Right now, Aaron Rodgers is plus 2,500. The guy who is currently in first place, in my opinion, in that category is currently in 17th place on this list. Actually, it's not in order, but still. Plus 2,500. That's big time cash, man. And you already know if you use co- promo code OVERTIME, they are going to double your first deposit. So you put in 100 bucks, they're going to give you another $100 to play with. And on top of that, when you take a screenshot of your deposit and you send it over to overtime at advertisecast.com, you're going to be entered in a drawing to win $500 at the end of September. And if you want to do one additional favor, just let me know when you do it, because I'm curious how many people are doing this. Just curious. Don't have to do it. So make sure you sign up at MyBookie today, and don't forget to send that screenshot to overtime at advertisecast.com. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong... 
you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. All righty dokey. First of all, we can probably rule out quarterback because um, you know who our quarterback is and you probably have a pretty good idea what positions he lined up in. However, if there's any question as to who our number two is, which there shouldn't be, Tim Boyle actually did have two snaps in this game. So there you go. Sorting through this offensive line, because it is somewhat interesting, so many people played so many different places, it's really hard to gauge. And I, I genuinely believe the Packers went back after this week and reevaluated the offensive line. In other words, it's not just us trying to figure out what their grand scheme is. I, I think they had to go back and try to figure it out. Right after Elton played so well and, and Rick Wagner played so well, I mean, my, my assumption is that they still believe Billy Turner is the best right tackle and they're going to put him out there. But I don't know. Because as I said, if Elton Jenkins can play right tackle, that solves several problems of ours. So maybe they want to try that out. But anyways, Rick Wagner, as you know, played right tackle. However, he also played two snaps at left tackle. I'm not entirely sure why. If uh, Bakhtiari got hurt for a couple snaps, I was not aware of that. But there you go. John Runyon, as I mentioned, played 14 snaps at right guard, but also one at right tackle. Lane Taylor is one of the few guys that stayed steady at 65 snaps, all at right guard. David Bakhtiari, well, here you go. The reason uh, Wagner was two snaps at left tackle because you had David Bakhtiari playing right tackle for one snap and right guard for one snap. Somebody's got to pull these clips up. What in the world? I just wonder if these guys who are taking these notes just completely messed up the number. It's possible. It's possible. It would be pretty frustrating, though, if, if that was the case because this kind of matters. Um, Elton Jenkins, 47 snaps at left guard, 33 at right tackle. So actually a pretty relatively even distribution. So it makes you feel good about the fact that he graded out so well, especially as a pass protector. I mentioned he wasn't very good as a run blocker, which again, pretty consistent theme. Whether or not you want to believe that, that doesn't really matter. I'm not trying to rain on your parade. I know he's seen as a really good run blocker. I'll let you have it. Lucas Patrick, 33 snaps at left guard, which again, can maybe sort of help inform what we think going forward, if we wanted to put Elton Jenkins out at right um, tackle, we've got a guy, Lucas Patrick, who I believe is uh, pretty much a full go, who's got all of his experience and did a decent job, granted against the uh, Minnesota Vikings defensive line, which so happy that when we talk about the Vikings, we have to put this constant caveat that the Vikings defense is so horrible. Right, yeah, but it was the Vikings' defensive line, so we know they suck. I mean, that's just that's been like their hallmark since forever. And Daniil Hunter has nothing to do with that. Daniil Hunter has nothing to do with the left guard, like ever in his career. And then Corey Lindsley, the mainstay, 80 snaps at center. He's just there all the time. He's a good man. So that was the offensive line. Y- y- I mean, going forward, I-, I don't know that I would necessarily even need to do offensive line. In an ideal world, we know who all these positions are, and they don't really shift around very much. But this week and definitely next week, we're going to be looking at it, and we'll see at what point, hopefully at some point, we have a uh, steady, consistent offensive line. But it, it does work to our advantage. It makes it harder for the Detroit Lions. Now, if, if this was just like the Pittsburgh Steelers defense or some kind of a dominant defense, we could even throw in the Bears if we wanted to. A really good defense, maybe you don't care quite as much because you're just going to play your, your style. But when you're the, the Lions and you don't have all that great of a defense, and you're trying to draw up a game plan on on who to attack and where to attack, and one of the best offensive linemen you have is Elton Jenkins, and you don't know if he's playing left guard or right tackle. You don't know if Lucas Patrick is going to be the left guard or if Elton Jenkins is the left guard. That kind of messes up your, your game plan a bit. So this all works to the Packers' advantage. And it's not as though it's like, well, which garbage player goes where. No, these are pretty good football players. Not that it couldn't be a problem. Again, the uh, Vikings aren't exactly the best team in the world, but neither are the Lions. I, I think Trey Flowers is probably the best pass rusher we've gone up against this year. I do think, and that's you know very controversial opinion, I do think he is marginally better than Yannick. I mean, I know he doesn't 
get as much praise or whatever, but if you just look at, at his pressure rate, how many times when he's trying to get to the quarterback does he beat the tackle in front of him? It's a higher rate than Yannick. But he also lines up pretty exclusively over on David Bakhtiari's side, unlike Yannick, so there's that. So I don't know, it'll be very interesting, and I'm, I'm not even going to try to make predictions because I, I was very declarative on what was going to happen last week, and I was very wrong about that. So I'll just keep my mouth shut, and we'll see what happens. Uh, next up, no particular order, but we're going to go with uh, running back next. Um, probably not a big surprise, but the order for running backs would be Aaron Jones, Jamal Williams, Tyler Irvin, and then A.J. Dillon. Exact snap counts. Aaron Jones, 42. Jamal Williams, 31. Tyler Irvin, 14. A.J. Dillon, 5. So this is where we start. And my contention would be Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams slowly drift downward. We'll see what happens with Tyler Irvin. 14 is not a terrible amount of snaps for kind of a gadget guy that may kind of stay about steady. We'll see if, if if his go up because basically every time the guy touches the ball, it's a big play. Biggest thing working against him is the fact that he's not a good run blocker and Matt LaFleur just ain't having that. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm kind of kidding, but at the same time, it's like, you know, it's it's important. So, um, But obviously, A.J. Dillon's snaps are going to drift up from five. So we'll, we'll see to what degree it shifts. I don't think it's going to shift all that much. We heard from Matt LaFleur that A.J. Dillon's snap count will go up. Um, again, I expect that to continue throughout the season. It's it's going to essentially go up as high as they trust. It, again, this is all about trust. Right now, this is a really good offense that's really, really clicking with a bunch of guys shuddy, with a bunch of guys that, that know what they're doing and forcing guys that don't know what they're doing out just because we like them or this is my vision or whatever. We, we heard from Matt LaFleur essentially say exactly in his press conference yesterday what I said in the podcast before him yesterday, that this is a slow, gradual unraveling. This is not, we're still not fully immersed in what Matt LaFleur envisions and what his offensive system would look like. I mentioned last year was nothing like a Matt LaFleur system. This year is starting to slowly look like a Matt LaFleur system, but we're still not quite there yet. It's a dumbed down version. It's still a beautiful thing, and if we just stay here forever, I don't know that I hate it, but we're still just gradually unraveling this thing. Um, in terms of specifics, our number one running back, Aaron Jones, lined up primarily, um, I guess you would say, in the eye, directly behind the quarterback 21 times, uh, offset left nine, offset right eight times, lined up in the slot twice, lined up out wide twice. So that would be 38 times in the backfield, twice in the slot, twice out wide. Jamal Williams on his 31 attempts, 27 in the backfield. His primary was actually uh, offset to the left, but a pretty even distribution across the uh, the spectrum. Kind of makes sense because he's utilized as such a much more versatile guy who's seen as less of a running back and more of a blocker slash receiver. So being offset right or left kind of makes sense. In fact, he was directly behind the quarterback the least amount of times. It was seven times there. Uh, offset right eight times. He was in the slot once and out wide three times, so again, four times out wide. I mean, four times lined up as a receiver, same as Aaron Jones. Tyler Irvin, no real surprise here. I'm, we, we're probably still mischaracterizing him as a running back. I mentioned this last year. He's a wide receiver, not a running back, but he only lined up twice in the backfield, 11 times in the slot, and once out wide. That's pretty similar to what he did last year, and I don't really expect that to change all that much. A.J. Dillon, all five of his carries came in the backfield. Um, the one interesting note about A.J. Dillon, and I mentioned this, this is when it gets exciting when you're talking about two running back set. He lined up three times as a halfback, which is basically straight behind the quarterback. Twice they called him a fullback, which I'm guessing is sort of offset left, but more of an H-back. In other words, closer. So take him to the left of the quarterback and then kind of drift him forward a little bit toward the line of scrimmage, or, or maybe toward the left tackle in that sort of angle. There is where you get A.J. Dillon to where he's probably, I mean, unless Aaron Rodgers is under center, he's probably not going to be the ball carrier, but it's one of those things. He could end up carrying the ball if Rodgers is under center because A.J. Dillon otherwise would be in front of Rodgers. He could be a lead blocker for a run play to Aaron Jones or Jamal, which, man, that would be a beefy package, wouldn't it? Aaron Jones run blocking for Jamal Williams with Alan Lazard and Josiah DeGuara and all these other guys blocking. I don't want to forget Mercedes Lewis. We'll get to that. Or he could be staying into pass block, or he could be running a route, right? Lots of options here, which I think is is similar. Again, I think A.J. Dillon and Josiah DeGuar are very similar in terms of A.J. Dillon is such a pivotal piece in this offense that Matt LaFleur really wants to be able to, to utilize. He's just not quite ready for it yet, so they're not going to push it, which is smart. But I, I just think the uh, 
And, and it also goes to the to the point of why Aaron Jones is still important in this offense. It's not like A.J. Dillon is just the guy. Aaron Jones is a completely different style of running back. And and part of what makes A.J. Dillon special is having a guy like Aaron Jones also on the field or on the team to be able to round out what A.J. Dillon does. Because if Aaron Jones is in the backfield and A.J. Dillon is lined up as a fullback, you're, you're much less concerned about A.J. Dillon, who may very well be the ball carrier or the receiving target or whatever. You don't know. Who knows what's going on back there? So... Um, it may not be possible to keep him financially, but the, uh, there's no question in my mind the Packers would love to find a way to make it happen because the, the dynamic nature of the offense with both of these guys and Tyler Irvin lined up, it just, oh, I'm getting chills. But that is your running back roundup, and I will continue to call Tyler Irvin a running back as long as everybody else keeps calling him a running back. But, I mean, it just it's just a name. It doesn't matter. We'll, we'll get into the specifics right here. Next is the wide receivers. Devontae Adams led all receivers with 70 snaps, but that was not all that much more than our number two, Alan Lazard, with 68. So basically, that's our number one and two. No question about it. Lazard is When, when Lazard is getting about as many snaps as Devontae, that's that's pretty declarative. Devontae also is our clearly our X receiver. They, they said he was our quote-unquote left wide receiver. All three of the other wide receivers, Lazard, MVS, and our number four receiver, Malik Taylor, were characterized as right wide receiver. They kind of just took turns out to that side and a little bit in the slot, but that's we'll get to that. Um, MVS, who is wide receiver number three, had 42 snap, so a pretty significant drop off, but still a, a big helping of MVS, which is encouraging, not only considering how well he played, but the fact that his his snap count was being decreased down to almost nothing. It's almost exactly the same as what he did last year in week one. He had 41 snap. But if you look at uh, after the bye, he had 29, 17, 10, 7, 13, 20, and then 15, and then 1 in that final game against the 49ers. So he didn't see 41 since, I mean, week 8 of last year was the last time he saw this many snaps. Actually, it's not even because he had 42. It would have been week 6 of last year when he had 57 snaps. Um, And Malik Taylor was only out there for 1, and he was in as a run blocker, so that's why you don't remember seeing him. In terms of the uh, the breakdown of his 70 snaps, 57 were out wide, 13 in the slot, 37 times off to the left, 20 times to the right. So he's used all over the plate. He's clearly just a matchup nightmare. He's such an awesome, versatile piece because it, it's just he's one of those guys that Matt LaFleur can game plan for in terms of how to attack a defense. Whether you want to put him against their strongest guy to be able to take him away, if you want to put him in the slot and have him attack weaknesses, he can attack short, he can attack deep. It's just such an amazing thing. And it doesn't have to be one thing in a game. It can be just throughout the game. We're, we're, we're trying to accomplish this, and the best way is to put Devontae in this position, and then then we'll have it. Alan Lazar, I mentioned yesterday, he's seemingly our top slot option. 38 of his snaps came out wide, 27 in the slot, once in line as a tight end, twice lined up in the backfield. So there's no question why a guy like Matt LaFleur would love a guy like Alan Lazard. Six foot five, two twenty seven. So Brian Gutekunst and Matt LaFleur just sit around and giggle to each other when they talk about Alan Lazard. But then to be able to use that kind of, of uh, versatility. And, and interestingly enough, Matt LaFleur had a little nugget uh, yesterday in his press conference when uh, somebody mentioned, you know, he's six five, two twenty seven, but he doesn't have a lot of speed. How do you kind of reconcile that? Something to that effect. I don't know what the question was, but... Bottom line is Matt LaFleur's like, yeah, I mean, I know he doesn't have a reputation for it, and he ran a 4-5-5 or whatever, but uh, the dude is one of the faster guys we have on this team, which kind of goes to the question of why do they keep using Alan Lazard on these jet sweeps? They should use a faster guy. Apparently, Matt LaFleur thinks he's plenty fast, but he sees him sort of as a Jordy Nelson fast guy, sort of a deep speed. Some of these guys, they, they're striders, so in a shorter distance, they're not very fast, but when you attack down the field, they sort of got that build-up speed. He, he specifically mentioned... I mean, he mentioned that that's the kind of speed he has specifically, but he talked about on kickoffs. He said, when we do kickoff drills, Alan Lazard is is one of the first, if not the first guys down the field. So um, again, just another example of why 40 time is, is, as much as I love it, because it gives a picture of a person's speed, it really is not indicative of a person's speed, right? We've had guys on this team that have had quote unquote speed. They've had pretty fast 40 times, clearly faster than Alan Lazard. They can't run past anybody. You know, Jeff Janis was a, what was he, 4-4-2, 4 4 something like that. Trevor Davis, same thing. I mean, granted, he got behind a couple people, but it's not just a guarantee that you, because you're fast, you run past everybody. And and Alan Lazard ran a 4 5, five and you got Matt LaFleur saying, no, nah, he's one of the quicker guys on the team. I shouldn't say quick, fast, deep speed. So, um, 
Anyways, again, versatile piece. Marquez Valdez Scantling. 27 of his 42 snaps were out wide, 14 in the slot, once in line as a tight end. Now, I can dream of a day in which we get a clearer picture of what exactly their job was in these roles, and if they ever gave grades for each individual lineup, which I, I don't think will ever happen, but I will happily pay for those advanced, advanced, advanced stats, <laughs> because I would love to know, but uh, we don't have that, so it just is what it is for now. And then Malik Taylor, his one snap. I mean, he did play several on special teams, and a lot of these guys do, and I, I haven't really mentioned that because it's not all that interesting. Um, but he's mostly been on special teams eight times on kick coverage, six on kick return, once on a punt, punt return. Um, but his one snap on offense was out wide as a just a wide receiver. And again, it was a run-blocking play. When you're 6'3", 220 pounds, this is why Malik Taylor made the roster, right? You're going to go out very, very rarely, very, very sparingly, and you're going to help block for our 250-pound running back, A.J. Dillon. I, I know it's probably not A.J. Dillon, but I still, I'm just, I just love, and, I, you know, I mentioned this, I don't know, a long time ago. But it's just, it's a different change of philosophy. And, and I, I talked about how Matt LaFleur and Mike Pettin together are making this a much more violent, much more big um, kind of a team. I mean, we, we haven't really had this kind of a mentality. Not that, you know, I'm not trying to pretend to be a Packers historian here, but the last time I can think of when this was sort of an emphasis, and maybe this was with Brett Favre, I don't necessarily remember it being the case, but it just, it, it reminds me a little bit more of a, of, of a Vince Lombardi mentality. Not that Matt LaFleur has, has, you know, the same sort of outward grit, nor do any of these players, but just sort of the mentality of we're going to be big, we're going to be strong, we're going to be smash mouth, we're going to be run the ball. But it's also meticulous, right? Whereas we, you know, Vince Lombardi loved rugged violence. He also was a brilliant human being. I, I, I still remember watching uh, John Madden talk about how he went to like a seminar with Vince Lombardi teaching. And he was all excited, and he, he went into that as a young man thinking he knew everything there was to know about coaching. He said it was an eight-hour eight seminar all on the, 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 the Packers sweep, the power sweep, whatever. Eight hours. So they did four hours or whatever. They, they took a break. They came back, did another four hours just covering the, the, the intricacies of one play. He said he left that, left that uh, whatever, the seminar. The, he left there just realizing, I don't know anything about coaching when you go that in depth about one play and, and I, I may be messing up the details ever so slightly but but again it just it just has that feel to it on one hand he's he's really smarter than everybody else but on the other hand whereas he's kind of got the x's and o's up in his head and he understands the intricacies and, and all these kinds of things when it comes down to the players he just asks these guys to number one do what you're told and trust the process and i'll, I'll handle the x's and o's number two big and violent that's it and you look at the emphasis more on big, strong running backs, big, strong wide receivers, tight end heavy, right? You know, as much as it's somewhat disconcerting to hear it, it also kind of plays into what I'm talking about right now when you hear a guy like Mercedes Lewis say, you know, teams just don't value tight ends like me anymore. So it's good to come to a team where they still value this kind of stuff. And on one hand, it's like, oh, great, we're, we're the only team still left in the in the Stone Ages. But on the other hand, it's like, yeah, the Packers are – one of the only teams left that are like, I'll, I'll happily take a Mercedes Lewis. For what we're doing, absolutely I will take that. And you see the result. When you have a highlight of um, A.J. Dillon, if you haven't seen it, it's out there somewhere, where the wide receiver takes out what appears to be a linebacker. Linebackers crashing down hard probably would have taken down A.J. Dillon, although that's certainly not a guarantee as big as that man is. But if, there, if there's no Alan Lazard, he, he at least disrupts the play. Alan Lazard just takes him out. His feet, you know... Head over heels, which is a stupid expression because your head's already over your heel. What we're referring to is when your heels go over your head. So I don't know why, why that's a thing. But anyways, it just it just excites me. Um, and as much as I would love to get a KJ Hamler type, smaller, shiftier type of guy, the ability to be multiple is is obviously extremely important to Matt Lafleur. And I think anytime you you tip your hand, in other words, we don't have the ability to run because we got this guy out there. Matt LaFleur hates that because he always wants to give the impression we're running. He wants everybody to crowd the line. And look what happened when the Vikings crowd the box. We carved them up through the air. But they had to keep cover, you know, stacking the box because we kept lining up in running formation. Because that's how we run. That's what we do. We line up and say, you better get up here because we're going to steamroll you. And they're like, all right, well, yeah, we better because if we don't, they will. 
So they stack the box because they're, they're scared of our power. They're scared of Aaron Jones' running ability. And then we throw it over their heads. And they know that that's a real good chance that that's exactly what we're doing. But they can't not stack the box. So we'll find out because I don't, I don't know if the Lions are planning to stack the box or not. If they do, we're going to keep trying to throw. Maybe they're going to feel like they have a better opportunity because they have better, better corners. We'll stack the box as well. They don't have very good linebackers, so that maybe they're a little bit scared of that. We're going to try it the same way the Vikings did, and hopefully we can cover better. And hopefully Aaron Rodgers takes a slight step back, and we'll, we'll end up doing what we do, and we'll, we'll win it that way. We don't want Aaron Jones running down our throat, especially with you guys beefing up your packages, bringing out these 230-pound wide receivers on top of your tight ends and your offensive linemen. We're stacking up. Or maybe they back off, in which case we get to see the glory of the other side of Matt LaFleur's offense, in which I'm trying to entice you to come up to the line, but if you don't want to, okay, <laughs> I tried to warn you. I told you to come up and, and, and play big boy football with me if you don't want to do that. You want to come out in your nickel package with one linebacker and one safety inside the box. Cheers. AJ, feast, my man. You want to see A.J. Dillon get a bunch of carries? Watch when they come out light and we go out heavy. Oh, is it weird if I'm sitting here in my basement by myself getting chills over and over again? I feel like if there isn't a lot of context behind that, that's weird. Fortunately, you guys have the context, so it's, I mean, it's not weird, right? It's totally not weird. Moving on to tight ends. Tons of talk about Josiah. Um... And every time we bring him up, I'm going to brag about the fact that I've been big on Josiah since, well, not day one. Again, I did not like the draft pick when it first happened. I will be completely and totally honest about that. But uh, I genuinely, just same with A.J. Dillon. I think he's going to get more and more. Um, but it's not, it, you know, there's a ceiling. And I, we don't know where the ceiling is because we don't know where his mentality is at and his ability to function in things. And, and you know, as much as I like that those A.J. Dillon runs, it doesn't get any simpler than take the ball and run forward, right? That That, that to me, is a guy that doesn't know a bunch yet, <laughs> you know. Uh, Deguara is clearly a little bit further ahead than that. He's already well. Let's just look, we'll look at the uh, the order so far. Robert Tanyan had 48 snap. Behind him is Mercedes Lewis with 32. Then Josiah Deguara with 24. Then Jay Sternberger with 12. Then John Lovett with one. So don't be too concerned about Jay Sternberger. I already mentioned the guy is extremely raw. This is the whole point. Josiah, Josiah is, is not just a piece that Matt LaFleur is going to love because of what he does in his versatility, which is absolutely true. More so than a Jace who's, who's just a receiving weapon, which most teams in the NFL love the Jace Sternbergers. Matt LaFleur is like, I'll take it. I'll love it. I want it. But give me Josiah. But also, again, Josiah DeGuara, he's got a ton of experience as a tight end running these kinds of concepts. He's much more plug-and-play for Matt LaFleur in terms of understanding genuinely what he's asked, being asked to do. Also, because he's a much more versatile piece, you put him out in more situations, whereas Jace goes out, and, and despite being doing a good job of blocking so far, uh, he, he's sort of a tip-your-hand kind of guy in terms of we kind of want him to go out and catch passes. But also, one year at Texas Tech, comes to Green Bay, gets a, a, a brief look, gets injured, doesn't play very much, so now he's kind of, he's still very young and very early in this so um you know there's a ceiling for him as well in terms of his understanding and it seems like he's coming along much more slowly than Josiah Deguara which is what I told you to expect but um I'm, I'm very open-minded about it I'm still excited about him I just think it's going to take time and hopefully if these guys stay healthy by the end of the year it's going to be a heavy dose of Jason Deguara which is again Jace and Deguara not Jason but I, I I think that's that's the ultimate goal here but um, in terms of alignment, you've got Robert Tanyan of his 48 snaps. 32 were in line, 12 in the slot, 4 out wide. Mercedes Lewis, 32 snaps, 29 in line, 3 out wide. Josiah, 16 in the backfield. That's sort of that H-back role that we were talking about where he's kind of like a tight end, but he's more fullbacky. 5 in line, 3 in the slot. Jace, 8 in line, 4 out wide, which is not the plan. Unless the plan changed, Jay Sternberger was supposed to be taken over for Jimmy, meaning more slot slash out wide type things. Jimmy Graham was 50% out wide. Matt LaFleur already said that Jace was going to be taking over that kind of a role and spending more time out wide. So far, he hasn't been doing that again. The plan for Jace clearly is not unraveled quite yet. Whether or not that ever happens, we'll have to see. But um, pretty slow progress thus far. And, and again, Josiah is already doubled the snap counts of Jace in week one with no preseason. Then Mr. John Lovett, 
lined up as a fullback with his one snap, because that's what he is. More or less kind of a decoy also, because when you got John Lovett coming out, who is the team's lone fullback, essentially, unless you want to call Josiah DeGuara a fullback, which, again, he's not. He lines up like it, but it's just a mischaracterization, right? How you picture a fullback and what their role is. Fullbacks don't line up at wide and all this other stuff. Anyways, you bring out the fullback for one play. What are you thinking if you're the Vikings? And then what do you think we did? We threw the ball. Not to love it, I don't think, but it's all just deception, man. So, so far, the, the, the tight ends have been used pretty exclusively in line. A lot of big boy packages type stuff. Again, we'll see how this uh, how this goes going forward. My, my, again, my assumption is uh, Jace, th- th- they're looking for that Jimmy Graham type of guy, and, and that's supposed to be Jace, and we'll see if that starts to happen or if somebody else takes that spot. Maybe Robert Tanya and they just start putting out and out wide more often. Or they're just fine. They're just like, well, we got we got Lazard we can put in the slot, and that's basically a tight end anyway, so we'll just roll with that. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. And maybe that's why Lazard is getting so many snaps in the slot, because that's essentially what they're looking at. Don't know. Interesting nonetheless. I'll let you come to your own conclusions, because it doesn't matter. It is what it is. Again, it's all just titles. Tight end, wide receiver. 2020 NFL, man. It's all just smushed together. So much overlap and everything. You got to be so much, you got to be so versatile today. You got to be able to do two, three, four different things. Um, flipping over to the defense now. The number one defensive tackle obviously is Kenny Clark, but he only played 15 snaps, which would actually make him four out of four, but that's only because of an injury. So it's Kenny Clark, number one, followed by Dean Lowry with 39 snaps, Kingsley Kiki with 29, Tyler Lancaster with 23. It largely just has to do with the fact that we just don't really have human beings to play, and these are the, the next guys up. A um, little bit of an interesting tidbit. The only guy, and, and again, this has been the, the, the case for a while, Kingsley Kiki is the only guy that graded out well against the run. Kingsley Kiki is built to be a pass-rushing defensive tackle. He has no ability to get to the quarterback. He's been consistently one of the better run-defending defensive tackles on this team. So it's got to be frustrating for Petten, who wants a guy to get after the quarterback, but at the same time, hey, we got somebody that can stop the run a little bit. So there's that. Tyler Lancaster, who was built to stop the run, graded out pretty good as a pass rusher. Terrible against the run. Horrible tackler. So I don't know what universe we're living in right now um, where that's the case. Also, Dean was the worst defensive lineman, the guy that we just paid a bunch of money to, and Kenny Clark is hurt. So it just it's just a chaotic mess in which nothing makes sense along the defensive line, and that's somewhat depressing. Am I foreshadowing something in my upcoming Mock Draft 7.0 that's going to be dropping uh, today or tomorrow? I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Do I even have a YouTube channel? Yes, I do. It's Pack Daddy NFL. Thanks for asking. Anyways, Mr. Kenny Clark, I mean, look, he, he's an interior guy. So, you know, we could just say he lined up out of his 15 snaps five times as a nose tackle, ten times as a defensive tackle, which sounds like a different thing. But at the same time, the difference between a nose tackle and a defensive tackle is alignment. Because if you're coming out in a 3-4 defense, the guy in the middle is a nose tackle. If you're coming out in a 4-3 kind of defense, in other words, four down linemen, and you have two guys inside, it's called a defensive tackle. So bottom line is he's on the inside. Um, no real distinction between left and right. Maybe a, a hair more to the left than to the right, but he's just he's just a guy in the middle. That's pretty much all Kenny is. Not to downplay it, he's a freak, I'm just saying. he's. It's not about versatility so much. He's, he's just, he's the man on the inside. Dean Lowry, who decided to uh, have his worst year ever in 2019 after we paid him a bunch of money, is on track to have an even worse year than that. So I don't know what's going on with Dean, but uh, not super thrilled about it. Dean's a little bit more versatile. He's never really lined up in the nose. Um, of his 39 snaps, the most prominent is that when we're lined up with four down linemen, he's playing defensive tackle next to what would be Kenny Clark. 24 of his snaps are coming from that, so a 4-3 defensive tackle is, is his most predominant usage. Um, in a 3-4 alignment, so three down linemen where Kenny Clark would be the nose tackle, 14 of his snaps came as a defensive end. In other words, he's down line just to the left or right of Kenny Clark. And then he had one snap in which he was a pass rushing defensive end in a four down alignment. So you got four guys down on the ground. The two guys on the end with their hand in the dirt are pass rushers. Dean Lowry lined up once as a outside pass rusher. Probably a, uh, a short down and distance situation would be my guess. In other words, a run play. Kingsley Kiki, who everyone is excited about because of his versatility, is not really being used as such. He's kind of being used as a guy that's a better run defender than a pass rusher. Uh, he lined up 
twice as a nose tackle in his 29 snap, 24 times out of his 29 times as a uh, 4-3 defensive tackle, three times as a 4-3 defensive end. So that's that's kind of that versatility, but I mean, he's got just a couple more than Dean Lowry. So he's clearly not being used in that capacity because he's not a very good pass rusher. He's just being used inside. Hopefully he can develop into something because it's not, uh, I don't know. I don't know, man. This is the least optimistic about our defensive line as I've felt in a while. I, 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 I always liked Dean. I was excited about Kingsley, and there was a little bit of excitement about Montrevious, at least maybe last year, a tiny bit, before the season started probably. But at this point, it's like, man, Montrevious can't do it. Kingsley, I don't just uh, just don't see it. Dean apparently has lost it. Now Kenny's hurt. Just sucks. Then you got Tyler Lancaster, who had a great rookie season, completely fell off in 2019, getting off to a slightly better start. But when the only reason you didn't grade out terribly is because of your pass rush ability, because you got one pressure in nine attempts, we know that's not going to hold up. So still not a great, uh, great thing. But Tyler Lancaster is the beef on this defensive line. Nine of his 23 snaps came at nose tackle. The other 14 were at uh, 4-3 defensive tackle. So he, like Kenny Clark, is just an inside guy. We actually got a ton of uh, pass rushers involved in this game. We had, it looks like, five of them. Preston and Zadarius tied for the number one spot with 43 snaps each. Rashawn Gary very closely behind with 32, which I'm happy to report is the most he's gotten ever. His highest prior to this was week three of last year. He was given 28 opportunities. He started the season this year with 32. So fantastic start. Glad to see that they're already giving him more opportunities, and I don't think he's doing a terrible job with that. Uh, But after that, we had Tippa Galea with nine, and then Jonathan Garvin with six. So we're getting these guys involved a little bit. I guess I'll kind of uh, break this down as well, because you've got run defense, pass rush, and coverage, which is a little bit interesting with uh, these guys in terms of how they're being utilized. Zedarius, 25 as a pass rusher, 17 run defense, 1 in coverage. Preston Smith, 17 pass rush, 17 run defense, 9 in coverage, which is pretty common. They don't use Zedarius in coverage very often. Preston, they do much more often. Rashawn, 22 attempts as a pass rusher, 0 in coverage, 10 to stop the run. Obviously, some of this is dictated by what the offense does, but um, really it just comes down to when it's a passing player, are you going after the quarterback or are you dropping into coverage? So uh, I've said it before, Rashawn Gary is basically Zedarius Smith. They want him to be much more versatile, maybe not to start. Again, we're very slowly unraveling things. We're just trying to get him to be a pass rusher right now um, on the outside. Then we slowly move him inside, which I haven't looked at the snaps yet, so I shouldn't be so declarative on that. Maybe they're already doing it. But, uh, yeah, they clearly see him as a, as a Zedarius type. He's a, he's a versatile pass rusher. We're not really interested in dropping him. Um, Galea, very much kind of even across the board. Five pass rush attempts, three run stop attempts, one uh, once he dropped into coverage. Jonathan Garvin, six attempts, every single one of them going after the quarterback. So I think Garvin is also sort of a, a Zadarius Rashawn kind of a guy. Not not versatile in terms of what we want him to do. We want him to go get quarterbacks, but I think that they like his his build and all that kind of stuff. But anyways, Zadarius Smith, who we know lines up all over the place. Brace, uh, bear with me because this is going to take a minute. He lined up out of his 43 attempts, six times as a defensive tack, five times as a 3-4 defensive end, which is a down defensive lineman. Once as a down defensive end, which is a pass rushing defensive end in a 4-3. 22 times as an outside linebacker, 13 to the right, 9 to the left. So they use him back and forth, pretty even. And then nine times they had him inside the box, which I have a, a feeling because what, what, what PFF has to do is where are you standing when the ball snapped, and then they kind of mark down where you are. So it's not as though he's actually being played as a linebacker in terms of what he's being asked to do, but it, it just goes to show where he's standing. And we've seen him all the time where he's just roaming. And I think when he's roaming and basically standing up, you know, between the two defensive tackles or whatever, I think he's being marked as a linebacker. So nine times they lined him up in the box. They have it uh, left inside linebacker, three times middle linebacker, three times right inside linebacker. Again, I just think that's when he's standing up in the middle of the field nine different times. So he's, again, he's being used all over. Defensive lineman, defensive end, outside linebacker. I'm not going to call him an inside linebacker because it's it sounds like he's doing a job that he's not. His, his job is a, as a pass rusher. It's just he's standing or crouching in different positions on the field. Preston is much easier, although much more interesting as well. Um, of his 43 snaps, 39 times he lined up as an outside linebacker. He doesn't mess around as a defensive end. He doesn't mess around as a defensive tackle, none of that. He is an outside linebacker, period. 
Interestingly enough, three times he was a slot corner. Probably has to do with man coverage in which uh, the guy goes out to the slot and Preston has to follow him, which is, you know, not super great, but it is what it is. Once, and I would love to see this, again, I'm curious if these PFF guys are just getting numbers wrong because I don't know how this happened. Preston lined up as a safety. Now, it's possible they were just had Preston kind of, he was going to drop into coverage, and maybe he just kind of declared a little bit early, so he started backpedaling, you know, just to kind of mess with Kirk Cousins' head. I don't know, but I would think, because if he backs up, he's in the box. <laughs> so he must have really been back there in order for uh, for them to declare him a free safety, unless he was lined up out wide and just was way back. I don't know, but you got that little nugget. Then we got Rashawn Gary. Of his 32 attempts, every single one of them was along the defensive line, none of the linebacker nonsense, but once as a defensive tackle, twice as a down defensive lineman in a 3-4, so a defensive end, once as a downed, uh, down defensive end in a 4-3, in other words, a pass rushing down lineman, 28 times as an outside linebacker. Again, they want him to be more versatile like Rashawn or like uh, Zadarius Smith. If you look at his snaps last year, it's pretty similar to what Zadarius looks like in week one. He's all over the place, but they're they're really trying to hone in. Again, 28 out of his 32 attempts, stand up outside linebacker. Just perfect that. Once you get that down, we'll, we'll expand this out a little bit. Then you got Mr. Jonathan, actually no, typical A is next. In order... Um, nine snaps, eight of them were as an outside linebacker, which you would expect. He's 6'5", 230 pounds, so you don't really want him along the uh, the defensive line all that much. But he did line up once as a left end, which would be a 3-4 defensive end, which is, you know, defensive lineman. So it must have just been kind of a weird thing. I don't know. These guys move around so much. When you, That's the thing. When you look at these snap counts, we, we always paint this pretty picture in our head of how things are. Like, you know, like when I was a kid and you'd draw it up on a little notebook or something and that's just what it is and we call these guys what they are but the amount of versatility and the amount of movement and chess piece placement all over the place is just staggering and you don't realize it until you look at these snap counts how silly it is to put these guys in a box because they all do just kind all kinds of crazy stuff like is he our slot corner well it's like yeah you know 58 percent of the time he's in the slot but he's out wide 42% of the time. He's a safety. He's a linebacker. He's all, I mean, these guys just get moved all over the place. Everybody does. I mean, some less than others, but when, when we talk about versatility and how we like versatility, it's just everybody has to be versatile to one degree or another. Even a 230-pound outside linebacker is playing in a Mike Pettin hybrid system as a de- down defensive lineman for a snap in week one. So, I mean, it's welcome to the NFL. Um, and then Jonathan Garvin, slightly bigger guy, 6'4", 256 pounds, but he was uh, once as a down defensive lineman on the interior as a left end, once as a down defensive lineman on the exterior as a pass rusher, and then four of his snaps came as an outside linebacker, which obviously is where they want them primarily. Next up, we got linebacker. There were three of them. Christian Kirksey was obviously number one with 52 snaps followed by Chris Barnes with 15, and then Oren Burks with three, which is just staggering. Oren Burks is not going to make this team. I'm surprised he even made it to the final 53. When we're putting Chris Barnes out in front of Oren Burks, that tells me we want nothing to do with Oren Burks. He's just depth. That's insane. I mean, I don't want to take away from Chris Barnes. Maybe it's just the Packers really see something in him. And that, that, I mean, that came out. He was our highest graded defensive player. Um, I mean, if he keeps this up, he's going to be our, our starting linebacker. But still, I mean, that's just, that's terrible for Oren Burks. And Oren Burks, again, didn't grade out all that well. It's close to 60, but again, when you only play three snaps, you're going to be close to 60 because you can't get that far away. So just not good for Oren. But looking at Christian Kirksey, out of his 52 snaps, 50 were inside the box. Um, that does come with, by the way, when we say in the box, there's all different kinds of linebacker designations, which I really don't care about, like how slightly to the left you are or whatever. However, that does include what they call a... Um, strong safety. Now again, it, it just kind of depends where you're standing, so it's it's kind of nebulous a bit, but three of these they did characterize as strong safety, three of the 50 in the box, once as a slot corner, once as a free safety. Again, it's just kind of where you're standing on the field. What your exact job was kind of is a different question, but I don't really have the answer to that. The point is though, when you're lined up as a free safety, if he's playing linebacker, he's way back. Now, it's also entirely possible that this is back when we're playing prevent defense or something. This could be like a 
a fourth and fifty play or something. Well, yeah, your 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 linebacker is going to be playing free safety. That could also account for why you got a guy like Preston Smith playing free safety because you got everybody back. That may be what we're talking about. Ultimately, when we're talking about one snap out of fifty-two. It's it's not that much, which includes slot corner, by the way, which is kind of telling about Christian Kirksey being our top guy and, and hardly ever going out into the slot. Um, Chris Barnes, who played, uh, let's see, let's get rid of special teams here. He played 15 snaps. 13 were in the box, none of which were characterized as strong safety. Two of them were in the slot. So again, kind of strange. He played more snaps in the slot than Christian Kirksey, despite getting, what, like a quarter of the amount of total snaps. And then Oren, who actually is getting a ton of special teams work, um, he had uh, 21 total snaps. Two of them were on defense. So obviously they, they like him on special teams, and I'll have to look at that and see if he's actually grading out well. That may be why he's even still on this team. But um, anyways, in his two snaps, he lined up once as an outside linebacker, something to keep an eye on, twice inside the box as a linebacker. Looking at the cornerbacks, if we're going just based on snap counts, uh, Kevin King was our number one. He had 51 opportunities. Jair, 49. Uh, Chandon, 36. Josh Jackson, 2. So they didn't forget about Josh. He got out there a little bit. Now, again, this is why snap counts aren't exactly the most important thing. As much as we can say Kevin King had more opportunities, who did they put on Adam Thielen all day? It was Jair. Kevin King, not one time. I shouldn't say that. I'm only looking at targets and receptions or what. It's possible they put him on Adam Thielen and he just never got targeted, which, you know, whatever. But um, of Kevin King's five targets, four of them were against Ola B.C. Johnson, one against Tajay Sharp. Of Jair's seven targets, six of them were Jair, were Adam Thielen, one was Justin Jefferson. So I don't think that's just a coincidence. I think these are the guys that they were protecting. But anyways, Kevin King's alignments, again... Somewhat of a grain of salt here, but 39 out of the 51 were out wide, two in the slot, 10 of them were inside the box, which when you try to think through why in the world would Kevin King ever be in the box, the only thing I can think is the guy that he's covering in man coverage goes inside. And he's if he's playing tight enough to the line of scrimmage, almost lined up as a tight end or possibly going into the backfield, you would have Kevin kind of playing inside the box. It's surprising that it's 10 times. Again, you'd have to watch the game and really try to see why he would be standing in that spot. But that's my assumption on why he would ever end up in that spot, because he's clearly not playing linebacker or or just an extremely tight formation, right? If they just come out, you know, maybe goal line situation where they're, they're coming out real tight, where's he going to be? Is he going to be out wide? No, he's going to be pretty tight. I don't think that would be the box, but whatever. You get what I'm saying. Um, for Jair, much less uh, much ne- less nebulous. 47 snaps out wide, two snaps in the corner, end of story. So Jair is just that guy, right? You just, you go out there, you stay out there. You shut down whoever's out there. Now, he didn't do that perfectly, but again, he did grade out very well. We know about a couple uh, bad plays. By the way, Adam Thielen, highest graded wide receiver in week one. And you could look at that and say, well, yeah, that's because Jair was so terrible. Well, he graded out pretty well, too. So, you know, if we want to take PFF with uh, any sort of, if we're going to pretend they know anything, Jair, a pretty tough matchup. And for a decent chunk of it, he held up. Although, granted, it felt like Thielen kind of just took whatever he wanted. I don't know, man. I don't know. Hopefully week two is better. That's all I'm going to say. Chandon, who graded out terribly, which which is not only a bad sign for Chandon Sullivan, but also if we assume he went up against Justin Jefferson all day, it's a pretty bad sign that, that possibly just Justin Jefferson's not too terrible. But um, 21 times in the slot, two out wide, 13 in the box. And when you're the slot guy, again, you're, you're closer to the box anyways. Who knows why you end up there? But there you have it. And also, he may have just been that guy. It's not impossible that he's sort of playing that hybrid role as a linebacker. When you're the slot guy, you, you it's a little bit more realistic that possibly you're doing that. We know Josh Jackson did that a lot. I just don't really see Kevin King doing it, which is why I made so many excuses. Um, Josh Jackson's two opportunities did come out wide. It might have just been like a fourth quarter, end of the game kind of a situation. They put him out there. But either way, it's nice to get confirmation he is officially our number four. Um, he is the backup, you know, if Jair or if... Uh, Kevin King go down. Josh Jackson's going to be the guy, and I'm 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 excited about the progress we saw from him. Hopefully, we have a football player in him. I don't know if we're going to see him all that much, but still pretty excited about it. And then finally, we've got four safeties. I guess interestingly enough, uh, three of them were characterized as free safeties. One is a strong safety, but then again, um, the guy that played 14 snaps at guard, one at tackle, got characterized as a tackle. So we'll we'll look at that a little closer as we go here, but. Um, Will Redmond was the one player characterized as a strong safety. Um, 
Adrian Amos, 52 snaps. Darnell Savage, 46. Will Redmond, 24. Vernon Scott got three. So props to Vernon Scott. And he's a 61.2. So again, he worked his way up from 60. So his three snaps were somewhat, I guess, not horrible. So that's that's something. But anyways, we'll start off with Adrian Amos. And uh, the safeties in general just had a bad day. Um, Will Redmond graded out poorly. Darnell Savage graded out horribly. And Adrian Amos graded out pretty poorly. Which I guess is somewhat of a positive. Because if it was just Darnell Savage, I'd be worried. But when everybody did poorly, it's like, all right, look, guys, we got to kind of tighten it up a little bit. And, and and the other thing I'm wondering about, and I don't really know if there's any validity to this or not, but bringing in the new DB coach, is there any sort of, you know, learning something new? Because that would seem to fly in the face of, like, isn't Petten kind of dictating what the safeties need to do? And, and this guy's job is to just kind of come in and, and help them to achieve that? Or is there actual delegation? I guess there would be, right? They kind of get control of what these guys do in terms of, you know, assignments and all that kind of stuff. But I don't know. I don't don't really know how that would all break down. Is it possible that this guy's kind of breaking them down a little bit, trying to get them to do new stuff, and it's it's hurting? Or is it just that Adam Thielen destroyed all of our corners and safeties by himself? I don't know. But I look forward to that bounce back because this this is not great. Not a good start. Anyways, Adrian Amos. 32 snaps at free safety, 14 in the box, 5 in the slot, once along the defensive line as an outside linebacker. Again, I don't know exactly what they were doing. Is he actually rushing the passer? Like, was he blitzing? Don't know. Didn't see it. I'm just giving you the information. If you want to go back and watch it and figure it out, go for it. Again, box we're considering to be sort of a, a strong safety role in terms of their designation. Seven were strong safety. Seven were actual just linebacker, which is obviously a possibility. Again, take it for what you will. For me personally, I'm looking at this sort of in a very boxy fashion, right? There's free safety, there's box, and then there's the cornerback position. Uh, for Darnell Savage, 46 attempts, 30 of them were at free safety. Nine of them were in the box. Six were in the slot once he was out wide as a corner. Will Redmond, the guy they designated as our strong safety, I, who I believe is going to be sort of the, uh, when Raven Green comes back, he's going to be taking this spot. But uh, 15 of his 24 were inside the box. Every single one of them was designated as a linebacker. So again, you got sort of that safety hybrid role. Six of them were in the slot. Two of them at free safety once along the defensive line as an outside linebacker. Again, whatever in your mind that is. So it may be. Finally, Vernon Scott and his three snaps, all three of them were as a free safety. So a pretty pretty dry episode, I'll, I'll grant you that. But I do think it's important, and I do think it's extremely interesting. Um, I know me and people like me definitely nerd out on some of this. So I, I, there's probably going to be a split. Some people think that this was the greatest episode they've ever heard. Other people are like, please don't ever do this again. But um, sorry to report, we will be doing this again. Because, again, I do find this not only extremely interesting, but important. And and not just, I mean, again, this is the baseline. We'll see where we go from here, how things shape out. And that'll help us to inform our thoughts in terms of of where the team is headed. If nothing else, it's going to help your fantasy team. All right, so there you go. Just lighten up, Francis. But that's it. I got uh, got work to do, man. I want to finish up this mock draft video. And then I got to get to work on the Packers-Lions breakdown-y stuff. So you folks have yourselves a fantabulous day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.